Um, would you please put your hands together for Leslie Manville and Mike Lee. sitting down because we're going to start with a couple of clips. So watch, listen and learn. Thank you. Now, you see actors and they're acting and they change, and it's an infin infinitesimal thing in the eyes, as they change eyes as they're talking. Can you see my eyes mm -hmm. changing here? Yes. Just I'm changing eyes. Yeah and I'm blinking. Now that is two of the worst things to do. First of all, you never change eyes, and you, what you do is you pick an eye. Now which eye do you pick? I look at, with this eye, because the camera is there, I look at this eye, at your eye there, mm -hmm. which brings my face, you can see. If I look with this eye at that eye, look what you get. You see the difference? But it's the same look. And if I keep blinking, it weakens me. But if I'm talking to you, and I don't blink, and I just keep going, and I don't blink, and I keep on going, and I don't blink, you start to listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> and sure. it makes me a very strong yeah. person, as opposed to someone who is sitting there going, yeah. which is someone who's completely flustered. See, I got married in my 20s, and granted, he was the wrong man, but I was too young. I couldn't handle it. But when I was in my 30s, I met the right man, and I was mature. I, I was ready for it. I mean, he left me, but what can you do? It's never too late, Mary. Oh, no, I know it isn't, Joe. And you know me. I'm very much a glass half full kind of girl. But it's tricky because I meet these older men who want somebody younger, and that's great because I fit the bill. But when they find out that, you know, I'm not as young as they thought, they don't want to know. My looks work against me. How old do you think I look, Joe? Sixty... Seventy... No, stop! <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's all right, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> so, when are we going to have this drink, then? Oh, I don't know. I have to check my diary. Yeah, you do that. Give me a call. I will. Promise. I promise. <laughs> so, obviously, my first question to you, Leslie, is we, was that left eye or right eye actor? <laughs> And how did you cope with the blinking aspect? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, obviously, um, I wasn't really thinking about the blinking or which eye or what eye because um, we're we're coming from a different place, aren't we? We're 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 starting with a different um, premise that's um, not to do with. I mean, I can see what Michael Caine's saying because there is. There is technique involved in filmmaking, obviously, and and I I sort of started to have a relationship with the camera, as it were, when we did Topsy Turvy, which was 2000? 1998. And, uh, and, and something sort of clicked in for me. I think before that, I was always so sort of in, in character and, and thinking that that's all I had to think about. And round about that time, just something else that's a bit hard to define started to happen. And I started to realise that I did have 
some sort of relationship with the camera as well. But I mean, you know, I mean, that's just, that's just Michael Caine's, that gets him through the night, doesn't it? That's what he does. That's what he, that's what he uses as his technique for, for film acting. But he is absolutely starting from a different place. But and I've had, I've had directors who have told me not to blink. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a few years ago, I was doing a film, and it wasn't just me. He was telling, he was saying to all the actors, um, try and say that whole sentence without blinking. And, and you know, it can really mess you up because you, you start thinking about not blinking. And, you know, it's... Um, I mean, you, you acted in front of cameras, um, not so much film cameras, but television cameras, from a very early age. Mm. And so, presumably, you, you will have had the kind of um, external acting, technical, doing it very quickly um, sort of experience. Um, and you must have been on some kind of... You must have had to cope with the exigencies of working in front of a camera without any, you know, f from an early age and without a great without deal Without any of... rehearsal, really. Yeah, yeah, talk I mean, about that's, that. that's, the, that's the thing. I mean, I'm, I'm doing a film at the moment and we've got um, some rehearsal and I've spoken to other actors and they've said, oh, my God, that's, un that's unheard of that you've got some rehearsal. And, and actually, really, when you think about it, it just seems ludicrous that you, you, you would go and do stuff without any rehearsal. But, I mean, it is, it is the nature of television mostly these but, days. But let's just look at that, because we take it for granted. I mean, uh, so, some of us here know exactly what that means, and perhaps some people may not. I mean, what... Describe, as it were, in case there is anybody, such a person here, for the lay audience participator, describe what, how you cope with acting in front of... in the filming situation without rehearsal? I mean, what do you have to deal with and how do you, how do you get by? And this relates to what you properly mm. call Michael Caine's um, coping mechanism. I mean, mm. talk about your experience of that. Because, you know, obviously we've worked together and at one extreme end of the spectrum, you know, we do films where by the time you get to the moment of what we shoot, you've, there's a whole history and we've been very complex and we've rehearsed it very thoroughly and so forth. But on the whole, you must have had a great deal of varied experiences of having to deal with the technicalities of, of acting in front of the camera uh, without, perhaps without help or without um, a basis or without foundation. Yes, I mean, I would, say, I would say pretty conclusively that apart from the films I've made with you and uh, plays that I do, uh, in the theatre, those are the only experiences of, of any extended rehearsals. And that's not to say that a lot of television and film directors don't want the time to rehearse. It's mostly economic, I think. Uh, and the problem also that I have is that I think a lot of the time people, because, because well, perhaps I'd like to think, people have seen me in work of yours and think that I've created characters that are very different from me and complex and different characters. So that I think people think that I can sort of do it by myself and that, that, that there's a feeling of, oh, well, you know, we'll get Leslie Mabel because she'll, she'll be able to do it. But I, ha I get no pleasure out of having to work out a performance on my own at home and turn up with it. And because that is what you have to do. We'll come to this a little bit later because we've got a couple of clips shortly which are about preparation and, and all of that. But in a way, what I think I'm asking you to talk about and to reflect on is, I mean, given that we're, we are, let's say, we are now talking about um, the kind of acting in a film where you haven't been able to collaborate and have guidance in the preparation. I'm really interested in you talking about the actual mechanics of filming, the actual, you know, moment to moment, the actual procedures of filming, uh, and coping with that, um, because it's tough, isn't it? Well, it can be tough. You mean under those circumstances yes, of yes. no... Yes, yes. Well, it, yes, it is. I mean, you, you, you are... You feel like... It, you can feel very alien and uncomfortable and... Um, Frightened, and I think people don't imagine that at my stage of my career that I would be scared about uh, that. And it's not a, it's not a, a kind of scare. Uh, it's not a sort of physical manifestation, I think. But it's just 
you know, I, I, you, you, you get to, you, you turn up and you get in the, you get in costume, and sometimes people are doing your makeup, which I really don't like, and they're doing my hair because I feel I want this character to be. It's about me and about what I want to do with this character, and you get all these other people who are putting their imposing their feelings about how they want this character to be and you 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 feel like it's you're losing sight of it but then you kind of think well I don't know what sight I have of it anyway because I don't really know how to play it because uh, uh, and then you're on the set and there's um, I mean I've just made a, a film in, in in Italy and uh, there was there was uh, no chance to to rehearse the scenes with the other actors so on, on the Romeo set. This is Juliet, isn't it? Yeah. And um, we, we were... The, the blocking and everything, uh, everything about the, the me physical mechanics of the scene had been worked out to accommodate the shots. And, um, you know, you, you, you sort of feel a bit like a robot. And, um, but somehow you've got to save your own neck because so you know you've got to come up with something and you know you've got to be good because at the end of the day, the, the audience watching it are not going to say, well, Leslie Mamba wasn't very good, but she probably wasn't very well directed and she probably <laughs> didn't have very much time. They're just going to think Leslie Mamba wasn't very good. And so you, I think my, my capacity to come up with something has got really good over the years. You're talking about you. Um, and it's interesting and important that you are, talk, you are forced to talk about you, the individual actor, in isolation. But, of course, what you're also, well, what we are implicitly also talking about is the um, lack of opportunity for the ensemble of actors, for the actors working with each other, to actually, um, mm. in some way, live together uh, in, in that supposed reality that's been created in front of the camera. Um, talk about the, how people cope with things with each other and for each other, and indeed in spite of and against each other and all that stuff. Yes, well, it's... I mean, you'd, you'd think it would make sense if you're, you know, creating a family on film or a relationship, that there would be... There needs to be some common ground and that there there needs to be certain stuff that is um, in some way investigated. And, of course, I don't go into jobs thinking, well, unless there's extensive rehearsals and we're going to say that, that I can't, that, that it's wrong. And Because all directors have their ways of working. And, uh, uh, and I, I absolutely respect that. And I never, I never expect somebody to um, uh, you know, conform to another director's way of working. Um, but it's... I think, I think that uh, actors tend to kind of try and pull together and pull something out of the bag. And, but you see, you're all working on different levels and, and, and it can become quite... Um, um, competitive is not the right word, but it... Although it can become competitive. Although it can become extremely competitive in the, with the wrong actor. But um, you, you're not all... Everyone's coming with their own agenda, and with everyone's imagining. Each actor is imagining a different reality. That's yes, somewhere. that's right, that's right. So there's no, and I mean, I, so I think one of the important things about rehearsing, even if it's a very short amount of time, is to get people together so that you you get a feeling at least of a of a common ground, or that you know you know you know what you're working towards, um, because it's. I think it, I think I've had experiences um, on on film and in television where, that you're left feeling extremely um, depressed, really uh, uh, depressed about the way that you're being um, forced to work. You talked about at, at the beginning a few minutes ago about suddenly developing what if I understood you correctly. Um, a, a sense of a, how to have a relationship with the camera uh, mm. when you were doing Topsy Turvy, presumably the, the back end of Topsy Turvy, the latest. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, can you just talk about what 
what that is? I mean, what... Yes, I mean, it's interesting. And it came from, it, it started, uh, I made a film for television, um, I think it must have been around that time of Topsy Turvy, or, with Helen Mirren. And she, she, we were playing sisters, and we, she was talking a lot about how uh, she really enjoyed filming. She loved this thing about the camera being there, but, and you sort of have to acknowledge it and know how to make its presence work for you as an actor and that you do the right things around. But, but it, it, it's sort of not there. And I, I, at the time, I kind of, I, I sort of listened to her. And, but it was, yeah, it was definitely before Topsy Toe. And then we did these scenes in Topsy Toe, particularly at the end of the, of the film. And, well, it is an odd thing, and it's more instinct than anything else, because I don't think, unlike with Michael Caine, where he's obviously has a sort of formula. With, with, it, it, it's more instinctive than that because, yes, you're playing the scene and you've got to you know, be in character, play the scene with the person that you're playing it with, but then there's this third eye, really. And, of course, although you've got to get the scene right and you've got to relate to the other character, you've also... It's no good if the camera isn't getting any of it. Um, and I remember when we did another year at the end of that end sequence, that there were there were little things that I with that long long sequence that uh, in the very final shot of another the tracking year, shot the table. tracking shot round the table that ended on um, what was her name? Your character, Mary. Mary, that's right. Um, <laughs> uh, ended on Mary's face and. Uh, very unusually, and you, because you, you never, I don't think I'd ever experienced you doing this, you, you, you said to me, just, um, just lift, your, lift your eyes a little bit. Just, you know, it was a small, I was just looking, focusing too low, and Mike just wanted me to focus up a little bit more so you could see. Now, and I hasten to add, Mike doesn't do that. That is, you know, he doesn't sit there and talk you through how to act a scene. But the reason that we did it, he did it then, was because this was an incredibly complicated shot that went circled round the table. And um, uh, we, uh, and also, on typically, we did many takes of it. We did 16, which is not usual. Some of them were just because I kept being in the wrong place. And yes, you I was, kept I was in a reflection in the shot. Yes, that's, that's just because right. I... That's just I'm a fat git. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, when we'd got a really good one that was good, you know, technically and camera and everybody and all the acting was good, you didn't want it to be spoiled because it's all one take. You couldn't cut into it. It's all one take. You didn't want to be spoiled just because I was sort of looking half an inch too low. So, you know. But, but, um, Sorry, I've digressed. It, no, but it? in a way it's interesting because when you report that you suddenly got that you had this kind of um, leap forward with the, how to work with the camera, as late as Topsy, so, because by the time oh, you met yes. Topsy, you'd made loads and loads of films. And yes. Film, you know, so it's interesting. You know, but in a way, uh, in, uh, as well as that, um, when you've done a huge amount of stage acting, and when you're on the stage, when, you, when one acts on the stage, and, when, and this is your experience, presumably, you do have... Um, a kind of organic, um, spatial um, sense of the space and your relationship with the audience. Uh, and, but So, in a way, that is... Your, your sense of the relationship to the camera has got somehow to be the equivalent of that. That's and a good yet, point. And yet, and yet, you, yeah. yet you only sort of hit that quite later on. I mean, well, that's interesting, isn't it? Yes, I don't... Be, well, I suppose... I suppose, for me... Uh, um, acting on stage is, um, I mean, of course, there are different technical r requirements. You know, you've got to be heard at the back of the Olivier and all that s sort of thing. Um, but it, it's kind of purer, I think, in a way. And, and I, I, I do think, and this isn't to negate great film actors in any way, but I think... The, I do think the ultimate test of an actor is to plonk them on stage and see how they go, because, uh, you know, I've seen it and you must have seen it. You, uh, you can edit round bad film acting, or you can certainly have a go. 
But the thing about being on stage is that absolute A, nobody's going to stop you. And you, you, know, you, you see the beginning and the end of the evening as some kind of arc that's your responsibility and you, know, you have to carry that. Um, and of course, the audience can look wherever they want. Um, so you, you know, you've got to be in it and on it all the time. Um, but it is, and I suppose I feel that I, I got, um, for my, in, by my own standards, good at stage acting much earlier. Um, and you're quite right, I'd done, I'd done probably 20-odd um, years of film acting, and then it all started to fit. But it's about confidence, I think, so much with film. Well, it, it, I mean, it, it obviously is, but a lot of that's to do with um, not, some, not just confidence in itself, but the taking away of those things that destroy confidence. Yes. I mean, a, a lot of what we began by talking about, and in a, in a couple of minutes we'll look at a couple of clips that, are, that relate to what we're now talking about. Um, it, it, it is, we've been talking about, implicitly talking about preparation, um, I've sort of try, wanting, trying to get you a bit to talk about the actual dealing with the mechanics of filming. Um, the, 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 the nature of the way that action is broken down, the responsibility in some way to repeat performances in, diff in different takes and in different shots, um, and also coping with the actual amount of technical stuff that's going on when you're actually trying yes i see well i mean i suppose i f yeah there is there's a load of technical stuff and there can be loads of reasons to do other takes although i have to say with quite often when i'm not working with you 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 feel like you're doing lots of takes because you're trying to get it right and i don't ever feel that that's the case with us i think we're doing extra takes because it could be a bonus and there will be subtle differences and you know there will be shifts and changes but they're they're subtle um, but often uh, with, with films you're just kind of thinking oh let's go again because I haven't got it right yet and and that isn't the case with working with you really. Michael Caine in a more of that which you can find on YouTube if you haven't seen it by the way um, uh, talks about I mean in fact what he's actually talking about there is you know um, angles and uh, um, eye lines and all the rest of it. Um, uh, Julie Walters, a long time ago, when she made Educating Rita, actually reported to me that um, Michael Caine um, encouraged her to place, because of a particular eye line, a particular shot, to play the scenes not to his eyes but to his shoulder, which um, is eccentric, by the way. <laughs> and um, but you do have to cope with stuff that's not, that, that's not actor friendly, don't that's you? That's right. And I, and I sort of feel that as a discipline, because there is, again, which is how it differs from theatre, you know, theatre is, it feels like a clear, clean space and it, it, it's not, you're not really bothered by the sort of amount of technical stuff that you are in films. But I sort of feel with filming that you need to sort of create a bit of a space around yourself that's... Um, you know, like if you've got, if I've got to do a scene that's really emotional, and you've got to a think, right? I'm, we might be doing at least five or six takes of this for a start, so you've got to have it. You've got to have the ability to do that again and again and again. But also, um, you know, I, I, ideally, I'd like everything to be quiet so that I could focus. And um, but of course, it isn't going to be quiet. So you sort of have to do whatever it takes to, to help you to do And I remember when we did um, another year, and uh, quite an interesting thing happened in the early part of the film where uh, Mary is quite drunk. And I'd never really played anybody drunk before. And, um, and you know, normally, when we're making films, I think a lot of people think that we walk around and it's all very internal and it's all very heavy and we don't have a laugh or anything, but we, you know, we absolutely do and we, we, we do go and do, we do takes and then we have a cup of tea and we talk and we, and whatever, or and whatever an actor needs to do that helps them. But I certainly found being, doing the drunk scenes, that I sort of needed to stay in it a little bit 
because more it was than you usually do. more than normal. It wasn't something. I mean, in fact, harder than emotional stuff. That it was. Uh, if I stopped, uh, it was really hard to get back into this kind of hazy, the muddiness of drunkenness. So. Uh, I don't think anybody clocked me doing it, but in between the takes of that, I just went to a room where the, there was nobody, and I just sort of kept it on the go very privately. On the whole, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't mean with a vodka and tonic. No, no. <laughs> she was stone cold sober, actually. Um, uh, I'm not p particularly disposed to, to talk about what we do. Uh, I mean, that looks after itself. But I suppose it is worth sharing in the context of what we're talking about and what we're about to look at. Um, that uh, what we do, or what, what happens on my films, is that apart from the fact that you, the actors, have absolutely prepared by creating the characters and we've created the whole world of the film and we've been very thorough in the construction of the scene right down to the last detail and all of that... When we're actually shooting, um, and I know that just being objective about it, this is different from many a film, and uh, you might talk about this. Um, the first instruction that goes out when we're going to go for a take is the instruction to warm up, which goes out from the, either from me or usually from the first AD. And that's an instruction to the actors to clear their heads and to get into character and prepare but it's also useful as an instruction to everybody else on the set because everyone knows that that's what the actors are doing. So it also means don't talk to the actors, don't, um, you know, don't make a noise and prepare for the, for the conditions mm. of the take because it is, a, it is a, 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 a convention, or there are endless numbers of conventions widely, where there's a kind of chaos and suddenly... You're mm. shooting, and mm. it's very hard for an actor... An actor's expected to kind of suddenly leap and be in the right place. Yeah, well, that's what I was meaning by yes, creating a sort of space around yourself where you can, you know, you can sort of lock... At, zone out of what's going on. But, of course, there are some aid, first ADs and directors who are very sensitive uh, to that. I mean, th I met the first AD that I'm going to be working with today, and she said, I'm completely about making the space right for the actors so that it's, you know, uh, you are the priorities. And that's quite refreshing, surprisingly enough. But having said all that, I think this is also important, that, you know, the, 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 um, the currency of what we're saying is that everything's there to serve the actor, that the camera's there to serve the actor and the crew's there to serve the actor. The camera is there to serve the actor, but what's equally important is the actor is there to serve the camera. Yes. And... You know, uh, the wor I think the worst kind of uh, filming situation is where there's a kind of earnest piety about the, uh, or, uh, the, 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 the cotton wool attitude to the actors, which inhibits the creative use of not only camera but sound and everything else. Yes. And it's important that you know that the actor in performance has got to be robust enough to deal with the, the subtleties and the exigencies uh, and the, the creative requirements, really, of, uh, of the film itself. Yes, and, um, and that particularly, what you're saying about the cotton wool thing, especially if, actually, what's led up to that has not been about that at all. No, exactly. <laughs> We've got two clips here. One is from... Truffaut's Day for Night. I'm going to call it La Nuit Americaine because the only copy I could get hold of hasn't got subtitles. You don't need subtitles for this sequence. Um, but it, is, it relates in many ways to what uh, we're talking about, as you'll see. And the second is um, footage of Charles Lawton in 1937 having a terrible time and ultimately uh, not really getting it together playing Claudius in uh, von Sternberg's film, I, Claudius, which was never completed. It was shot at Denham Studios. It was never actually completed because Merle Oberon, who was in the film, um, was in a car accident and the insurers pulled the film. Um, have a look at these two clips, because they do relate to what we've been talking about, and I think they will take us to further discussion.
Lei è tutta me, la fan d'Alfonso, si sa. On dirait che tu la detesti e che tu fai exprès di non mai adresser la parola. Qu'est-ce que vous faites là Vous voyez que je parle à monsieur. Et alors, allez vite. Et ça, je ne le supporte pas. Ah. Oh. Je l'ai faite. C'était bien, hein, c'est enfin, C'était très bien. bien enfin, hein. C'était bien, c'était bien. Mais c'est pas cette porte-là, vous voyez Ah, je alors, pensais que c'était la même. Ça, non, ça c'est la recette. Oh, et ici, idiot. vous avez la vraie porte, voilà. Je pensais que c'était la même, alors oui. on va la faire. Alors, voilà, on se ramène au départ, on refait aussitôt. Je m'excuse, mais je ne sais pas si c'est la même porte. C'est pas grave, cette fille. Alors attention. Elles ensemble. Ça va Hein. Je vais essayer de tirer un peu. Hauteur. Pamela, 36 deuxième. Sébrine. Franchement, je ne te comprends pas, Alexandre. Tu es bizarre depuis quelques temps. Hier soir, quand tu as quitté le repas en plein milieu, c'était très grossier vis-à-vis -vis de Pamela. Elle est tout de même la femme d'Alphonse, tu sais. On dirait que tu la détestes et que tu fais exprès de jamais lui adresser la parole. Qu'est-ce que vous faites là Vous voyez que je parle à monsieur, alors Allez, très vite. Et ça, je ne le supporte pas. Coupez. Écoute, chérie, regarde bien. Je, je sais, les, les deux portes sont pas si pareilles, mais... Non, ça, non, 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 c'est pas ça, mais c'est ça. I understand you, I'm not an idiot, after all. No. It's only that I don't know what's happened with me. Oh, oh Bernardo. Tu es la seule personne qui me comprend. Tu peux venir dans ma loge, Bernardo. Tu viens chez moi, là, dans ma loge. Sûr, 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 sûr. Non, ce n'est pas ça. Ce n'est pas ça, mais c'est ça. Bonjour, Bernardo. Allons-y. Bonjour, Bernardo. 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 Bonjour, tu es... tu es bizarre depuis quelque temps. Hier soir, quand tu as quitté le repas en plein milieu, c'était très grossier vis-à-vis -vis de Pamela, tu sais. Il est tout de même la femme d'Alphonse. On dirait que, que tu la détestes et que tu fais exprès de jamais lui adresser la parole. Oh, qu'est-ce que vous faites là Vous voyez que je parle à monsieur, alors allez très vite. Et ça, je ne le supporte pas. C'est foutu, elle n'y arrivera pas. C'est pas ma faute. Coupé. On va le refaire. C'est pas ma faute. Écoute, pas grave. Non, Ferran, c'est pas ma faute. Moi, je suis très confuse. Je sais pas s'il est audit, s'il est l'actrice, s'il est la maquilleuse. Ça m'a confuse beaucoup, tu sais. Dans mon temps, les actrices étaient les actrices. Les, les maquilleuses étaient les maquilleuses. C'est pas ma faute. Je sais quand on Voilà. Jean-François. Bon, s'il vous plaît, tous les gens qui n'ont rien à faire sur le plateau, s'il vous plaît, je vous demande de sortir. Asiaticus, stand up. Not only are you a stuffed and puffed up... Not only are you a profiteer, but... Not only are you a profiteer, but since we're dealing in personalities, you are a stuffed and puffed up glutton. You'd sell your soul for the tail end of an anchovy. Since no one else seems eager to show his eloquence, I will inform you of the conditions upon which I will accept your, your support. I'm sorry, I've gone. Since no one else seems eager to show his eloquence, that's the wrong word. What? My lord sent his. I did not know you could also stutter. I, I thought your talents were confined to neighing like a horse. Is there anyone else who wishes to call attention to my misfortunes? That's the broadest East End Cockney I've ever heard in my life. In fact, day after day, he used to arrive at the studio and say, I can't find the man, Joe. I can't get the man. And he had the idea that perhaps if he started on a different sequence, he could work himself into the film. And so, as at that time, we were the only film company filming at Denham, we built stage after stage on each of the many, uh, set after set on each of the many stages in the studios. And each day we'd start on a different sequence and hope that Charles would perhaps find the man. 
And then one day he arrived breathless and rather late on the set, very excited, and came up and said, Joe, I've got the man. i found him. Don't you realize it's Edward VIII? And he got hold of a gramophone record of Edward VIII's abdication speech to the nation. And thereafter, he would never film until he'd first of all retired to his dressing room, which was a caravan on the set, and played through Edward's last speech as king to the nation. And after he'd heard it through, Charles would come and try and play his part of Claudius in the film. Poor bugger. I mean, just, you just feel for him, really, you do. You just feel for him. It, it's painful, because, you know, he's just... He's just uh, He's just lost, isn't he? He's just really, really, really lost. And then he ends up listening to tapes to get some, you know... A gramophone. Yeah, a gramophone record. But if he'd have done, you know, if, he'd, if only he'd have had, if only he'd have had the chance to do it, to rehearse and get it and do it in collaboration, he... Or to find something to have, to, pre to prepare mm. in some way. Mm. It, it is... You um, see, you can't do it on your own. I, th I think... I, I feel a lot of the time that, um, that if people think you can act half decently, they think that you, 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 you absolutely don't need directing, or it's, and it's ludicrous. I can't do it on my own, and I don't want to. But, um, in the, the, the footage we've just seen, as some of you will know, is from a BBC uh, documentary, um, which uh, is called The Epic That Never Was. And... Um, there's footage of Josef von Sternberg, uh, who was still around in 1967 when the documentary was made, um, talking about the film. And he actually says, um, I didn't have any trouble with anybody except Lawton. Lawton was difficult. Um, and he's quite nice about Lawton, but he, that's as much as he says. And you kind of know that... Lawton is really expected to show up and deliver the goods in the way that you mm, have talked mm. about. But in a way, I, I, whenever I've seen that footage, it just strikes to the very heart of the actor's problem. I, I mean, what compounds what we've just seen is that he's going through this hell with the um, mortifying embarrassment of having to do it in front of a very large number of extras standing there on, in the, on the mm. set at Denham, and it makes it it's very difficult. Yes, yeah, it? very undignified for him, really, isn't it? As to the other clip, it is, hilarious as it is, it ha is, however, um, I mean, that's a classic um, uh, portrait of an actress coping in every way she can <laughs> under pressure. Um, and again, it, it's, it's really the same thing, um, but... It, it is only a fiction. Yes. And, and um, wonderful iron. It's done with incredible uh, confidence, and uh, it's a great piece of, yeah. of film. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we're back with this bogey of um, preparation, really. Yes. Um, what do you do? I mean, when it comes to the crunch, how do you prepare when it's not, when there isn't the kind of collaboration that. You know, what do you do? Well, I mean, I, I, as you know, we had a conversation about this before. I mean, I dis I'm reminded constantly by when talking to actors, I, I don't really n know how, how, how it works in proper films. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I yeah. forgot or I've forgotten. I don't actually know. So, what do you do? What's well, the process? Or does it vary from... Well, it, I, it really does depend how much input you're getting from the director. And, and, and they can be very involved from early on and want to talk about it and discuss the character and all of those things and talk about costumes and things with you. And so you, then you feel, you know, you're, you're well, kind of... That's the good side. That's the good side. The good side. So the, the worst case scenario, I guess, is that, you know, you've got... Uh, well, I'll just read it and keep reading it. And, and I suppose I'm hoping that some kind of, something will come to sort of a peg to hang something on. And it could be something small, like how I think somebody's hair should look, or, or, or a tone of voice, or... Um, 
presumably sometimes it's an actual clue in the story or the action or the yes, journey, it can be. The journey of the character. It can be, but, some, but sometimes it isn't. And you're just sort of fishing around for something and then you get on something and you can grow with it. And, and I suppose I just have a go and I start to um, potter around at home trying to sort of, you know, hit, speak their voice and be them and just start to kind of get it on the go a little bit, just so that when you do turn up, day one of filming, day one, scene one, you're not kind of uh, rigid with a sort of an inertia of, well, how, um, what, it, what is she going to sound like? What is she going to look like? It's, it's kind of, you've, you've, that, you've just dipped your toe in the water a bit, really. Um, at the extreme end of the spectrum, when we do what we do, um, we, to begin with, as soon as you start to do any, as soon as I get you to do any sort of actual practical character work at all, way before we really got any idea as to the details of the character, once there's something rudimentary on the go, um, I encourage you to do it in some kind of costume. Yes. So that you're always working in costume whenever you do anything. And that evolves and the costume designer joins in and gets the hang of what we think has helped to define the character, because the costume sort of does. Yes. And then by the time, uh, then, you know, there's a great deal of collaboration on the costume between you and the costume designer and, indeed, me. And so, by the time you get to shoot, you're wearing a costume that you are very familiar with, and yep. it's grown into the character, and the character's part of it, and it's been very carefully chosen. Now, Presumably, in many circumstances, and you've just been talking about, you know, you, you show up to film and you hope that the voice, etc., etc., um, the, the costume, which is a very essential and integral part of acting, character mm. acting, mm. Um, it, it comes as a kind of unsympathetic external. Well, it does, and it's worrying. I mean, and, and I'm worried at the moment about that very aspect of that. I'm going to Berlin in a few weeks to shoot a, a cameo in a film. And the, the character is, the costume of this character is really very specific and very, very, very integral to what this woman is. Although it has to be said, all costumes are. All costumes are. Well, of course. Yes, that's true. That's true. Um, but this is a costume, the sort of, you know, it's a modern costume, but it's not like anything I would wear. So I will feel strange in it, apart from anything else. As you should, because she's not you. Indeed, but especially so, because this costume is quite alien to me. The, you know. the costume's in the, in the story. Itself. Yes. Okay. Now, I'm only going to get there, I'm going to fly on the Monday and shoot on the Tuesday. So... Hopefully, on the Monday, they're going to have clothes that are going to fit me and they're going to look right and I'm going to think they're right. And I, but how I'm going to uh, make them feel like they're embedded in any ways, you know, that's it. But, that, but that's, you know, it's, that's, that, is the tar that is what you've got. There's nothing you can do about that. I can't... There is not the money to fly me out there two weeks before to... To go shopping and get the costumes and so, and so I maybe could bring them back and work them. There's, there isn't the time or money to do that. Has, have, have you ever experienced a performance being compromised by the costume that you... or even spoilt or ruined by the costume you've had to wear? I can't think of anything offhand, no. No, I can't. But, I mean, it's not, it's not such a... It, it's not that... Um, it isn't ideal, but the, tr the fact is, that is just how it is. And, the, and it's, it's another kind of, it's another stumbling block to, to, to actors getting in front of a camera and being comfortable and feeling secure with some level of confidence about what, what you're going to do. I suppose, well, it is the case, isn't it? But the same is true of your relationship to the environment you're in. I mean, if you're playing mm. a character that lives somewhere and you've never seen it before and it's not exactly how you would have imagined it and you're not used to the particular chair, which you should have been 
should yeah. be used to because you've had it for 50 years. I mean, yes. it's that, those things too, isn't it? Yes, I mean, so, so, but, but given that that is the status quo, what, you know, what you have to do as an actor is assimilate all these things very quickly. How do you do that? You assimilate them quickly. But, <laughs> but do you do anything? Do you, do you, is there anything you actually do? Um, well, <laughs> By way of assimilating. I mean, you know, you get on the set, you look around, you feel, you think, oh, this is that, and you might say, oh, I don't think that's right, and then you get rid of something. But, you know, you just have to do it fast. And there's no point moaning about it. There's no point saying, you know, time and time again, well, this isn't ideal, because it's the way it is. What's, talk about the things you love about acting on film and the things that turn you on about it. Well, I suppose I re I, I, it's... I love that quiet moment when, it, you know, you, you turn over and, and then for a moment, for, for however long the tape lasts, it is down to you and you're not going to have that noise going on. And it's, I suppose it's just, it's the pure, it's the pure acting. I like acting. But, I mean, you like acting on the stage as well. Mm. So what I guess I want to push you a little bit to talk about is what is it about the film acting experience itself as opposed to just acting? Because acting is acting in the end. Yes. I mean, look... What do you think? What do you think we get well, out of it? Well, 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 I was going to say before I answer that question, which is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> is, no, I mean, for me, doing... Um, mostly films and sometimes plays, and we've just done a play at the National Theatre together, in case you weren't aware of that. <laughs> um, um, uh, in the end, the joy of film, apart from the joy of film itself and the whole language of film, what you can do with it, apart from anything else, it's the thing of being a breathing real air. It's, 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 it's the welding together, or the bringing together of, it's the harmony, if you like, of the fiction that we've created and the real world, interfacing with the real world, yes. you know. Um, uh, so that's part of the sort of buzz of it yes. for me. Because we, we, we shoot, well, you shoot, we always on real, real sets, real locations, more pretty or less, much. Yes, yeah. although interestingly, your um, clairvoyant satire on Topsy TV was on a, although it was in a real place, not a, actually a studio, it was in studio mode, we built sets. Yes, yeah. But however, um, it's that, I mean, does that, do you get a buzz out of the being in real places aspect of filmmaking? Yes, I do, I do, and I, and I suppose the other thing is that it, it is, you, you're forced to uh, see it in a different way because you're shooting in, it's all little bits, and then all those bits are going to be put together. So you're thinking differently. You're not thinking of a two-hour evening. You're thinking of making this one minute right, but, but it has to fit in with the previous minute and the next minute and all of that. Uh, so I, I quite enjoy that, which seems... And, and that, for me, means that, unlike when we work, but if you've got a conventional script, film script, I feel I need to know it inside out, backwards and forwards, because you're not going to shoot in sequence and you really have sort of got to do the graph of where this story goes for you so that if you do dip into, you know, episode four before you've shot episode two, you, 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 you've got to absolutely know where, where you're going with it. So that's quite... I quite like doing all of that. It's, you know, it's sort of quite methodical in a way. It's creative ultimately, but the... But I sort of look at it like a map, you know, it's quite interesting. Um, and, and I suppose I also like, it, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of what, well, it isn't really what Michael Caine's saying, but it, it's, I love it when the camera is, I always love it when, you, when we do the close-ups, because it's, it's about a flick of an eye or a, a look to somebody or and I love all of that and I and I, I I I like it when we change the lens and it's something closer and you 
you kind of modulate it for, to facilitate that. I mean, what is wonderful about filming, is it not, is that, and I mean filming in the classical way with one camera uh, and doing all the setups with one camera, is that each moment in each take of each shot, at any given moment, the whole universe is geared up to that moment. And it may be a moment that we, the audience won't see because its equivalent moment from another take or another shot may be. The, mm, mm. Uh, and that's another reality which will be created as films are in the cutting room. But um, the joy of film making for me is the fact that every moment is the centre of the universe. And everything is geared up and focused on that moment. And that's a, from... from the pure acting point of view, I should have thought that's the buzz, isn't it, really? Yes, it is. And, and it, yes, it is, about, it is about that. And that's what I meant when I say it, go, you know, it goes quiet and it's all focused and, and, and that is what it's all about. And, I mean, the fact that there are a hundred people, some of them who may be some distance away, preparing lunch or, yeah. wait, or looking <laughs> after trucks or something, are all focused in on that yes. moment. Yeah. Yes, yes. Talk about um, your experience as an actor, as your relationship with the, with the cinematographer. And incidentally, the cinematographer we work with very often, Dick Pope, is in the audience. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, I suppose the thing about what I love about listening to you and Dick when you're working out the scene, how to shoot it, because we, you know, Mike, Mike isn't saying right. We, this is the scene, and you're going to come in there, and you know, we, we work on the scene, we, we create the scene, and then I love listening to you and Dick talking about. Why? Well, because I'm doing my thing with the other actors, and we're doing what we're doing, and then you have to look at that, understand it, emotionally engage with it, and then work out how the camera is emotionally going to tell that story best. But what do you love about listening to it? Apart from the fact that we're eloquent and interesting, <laughs> creative <laughs> artists. Well, it's just, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's not for any reasons to do with how it affects me uh, from a technical perspective. Yeah. I'm just interested in hearing two people discuss a, 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 create, a bit of the creative process that is in some ways separate from mine but 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 isn't because obviously it's it, it, we're, it's only you're trying to represent what you're doing a cinema cinemagraphic cinematographic cinematic 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 representation of what we're doing sure. as actors um, so does it but i mean obviously you say it doesn't affect directly what you do because you do what you do but just out of interest, I mean, do you derive, does it inform what you do in some way? Does it, in other words, does a an understanding of the filmic aspect? Yes, yes it does. How does it do that? Well, because I suppose I start to see it how I know you're going to shoot it. And some of my favourite shots of yours and Mike's are when you just let the camera rest and it you don't sometimes always cut in or you don't, you know, you just show the action. And also you, you often hold a shot after a scene's ended. I mean, you've done that on, on several films that I've made with you, but it, 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 I just love it. And so I know, and I, so I, I know that if, if you're going to do, if, some, if somebody was going to, you were doing this and it was going to be the two shot of you and me and we'd just be going on for a long time. Um, it's different, I suppose, for me in how I would relate to you as the other actor sitting next to me because I know it's a, a, a wide two shot and that therefore that the, relation, the camera has got that relationship with us. It's interesting because, of course, I mean, uh, apart from anything else, um, I would never and have never let you or any actor look at rushes because uh, I don't think that helps an actor at all. No. Um, uh, uh, and we'll perhaps come back to that in a moment. Um, 
uh, and on the whole, the principle of what we do is that you know you're very much. It's very much about the action and being inside it from your point of view. But and why do you? Why are you? Um, I mean, I agree with you about not washing. Uh, watching, we'll come back to that. All oh, right. Okay. But, but j just um, w what's interesting about what what you're saying is that although you are you're very much um, the discipline of what you do is very much being inside the the action and not thinking about the mechanics, that you still have developed a sophisticated ability to have an awareness of the. Well, I think you have to, and, and I think you cannot just be, you know, so in character that your antennae just doesn't pick up anything else, and uh, because you, 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 you've got to, and I, I think that's what I started to feel when I talked about getting good with film yes. acting, yeah. that that started to ha happen, kick in for me, um, but, it's, but it's also a discipline that that is used in the creative process of our work because we, we, we are create, you work with us individually to create characters and we, we create those characters, but after we've come out of character, we do need to dissect it and talk about it. Yes. So, you know, I need to have my antennae on the go so that I'm, um, there's always a bit of me observing what I'm doing, if you like. Absolutely. How about watching Rushes? I, I, you've never watched it. Do you watch Rushes? Um, have you watched Rushes on other projects? No, not as a rule, but sometimes uh, uh, I've watched them very, very rarely and occasionally when you have to watch something back because you've perhaps got to pick up a shot and so you need to watch it for continuity reasons. But in terms of it being part of the ongoing creative process, uh, would you agree that, generally speaking, it's counterproductive? I think it's really not good, and, and, and I think that, that one of the worst cases of it was this when I've just been shooting Romeo and Juliet in Italy, and, and the young actors were rushing to look at themselves as soon as they'd shot it. And how did it affect them? Well, it, they, it, 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 it makes them think about their hair, and, the, and it's, you know, it, I mean, it literally does, and it's, it's absolute... I mean, I was sort of fuming about it but it wasn't my set I can't I couldn't say anything but I and there was a laziness about it as well it was it was it what annoyed me was that it wasn't considered at all whether it might be good for these I don't think it'd be good for me and I've been acting for a long time but I really thought for them they were young and it was counterproductive for them absolutely totally but nobody even thought about that when I was very young, when I was 19, I was in a feature film um, called Two Left Feet, and I had a very tiny part, but I used to go every day to the shoot. And there was a young cast of people like Michael Crawford and <clears throat> Irie Dawn Porter and David Hemmings and people. And every day at Shepperton Studios, we, everybody piled into the, uh, this little preview theatre at lunchtime and watched the rushes. And I innocent as I was about things and I know that I watched the entire cast I mean, not me because I wasn't really I was just not doing anything but um, the entire cast all the performances disintegrated as a result of the self-consciousness mm. uh, that watching the rushes and again it was it was just a convention it wasn't really considered so mm. you know, that's what. Yes. well we're going to look at um, a few clips finally uh, and the first of these is um, a, 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 a scene from the firm a film you made with Alan Clark um, <coughs> sadly deceased um, and what's um, actually what the characteristic of all the clips that we're about to see is that they are all contained within one shot, more or less. Yeah. Um, but I think it might be useful, since um, this is quite, an ex quite a sort of radical piece of shooting, uh, 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 this first clip from the firm, if rather than talk about it after the audience has seen it, if you just talk about how um, you, with Alan Clark and Gary Oldman, set about uh, preparing and shooting the scene so that we may understand that when we look at it. Mm. Well, we shot the whole film of the firm, which we made in 1988. We shot the whole film on Steadicam, which is a camera um, that is strapped to the camera, camera person and it, 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 it affords um, uh, freedom because uh, uh, you, you, do, you, you do 
the, the, the camera can be fluid, the, 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 it can move wherever it wants to and follow the actors. There's a great fluidity about it, and Alan, Alan liked that. Didn't Alan he? liked it a lot, and he, because of the nature of this film, it was a, and it, this film was highly controversial at the time. I know it doesn't seem like it; it's only 24 years ago, but it was incredibly controversial, and uh, it dealt with um, football hooliganism, uh, and there were so many conversations with Alan phoning me up afterwards about the delay that it was going to have in transmission because the BBC were very tough on the censorship and um, interestingly the, the, there was uh, there was a scene from this that we shot that was finally cut and uh, <clears throat> it's a scene where you think the husband is raping his wife and then it turns out that actually they start laughing and the wife quite likes it and this is kind of semi-violent game that they play sexually and the problem that the BBC had with it was not that he was raping his wife, but that the woman was complicit in it. Um, and the BBC were absolutely clear that to show a woman being complicit with any kind of sexual violence was, um, was not palatable. But the scene that you're, we're going to watch was interesting from another aspect as well, uh, apart from the way we shot it, um, because... Uh, Alan rang me up and said, uh, because we'd shot it on this Steadicam, so it's all one, all one take, um, he, he, he wanted to end the scene on my character at the door saying, fuck off. But he couldn't do that because the BBC had said, no, Leslie's character has said fuck eight times already <laughs> and she can't say it nine. And he fought and fought and fought. And he said, well, I want to end the scene how I want to end the scene. And so he had to compromise it. So now the scene has to end on uh, Bexy um, because you couldn't, because of the shooting on Steadicam, you couldn't cut round it. Um, it ends outside. <laughs> on it ends outside on a shot of Gary because uh, you, you couldn't... Talk about the actual shooting of it. And the mm. prepare, the re did you rehearse this? Yes, we had extensive it, rehearsals. I, 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 when I look at it, um, am I right in thinking that you've, it's very, very thoroughly rehearsed? Yes. And although there's, there's overlap of the dialogue and things, it's very, very prepared, isn't it? Very prepared. Um, very, very, we had, we had a, a long time rehearsing up at the old Acton rehearsal rooms that the BBC used to have. And, uh, and, they were, and the rehearsals were with uh, John, oh God, I've forgotten his surname, the cameraman, the, the cameraman who was working on the Steadicam, which is an exhausting thing to do, shoot these long takes on, with one guy with this heavy camera strapped to his body. Um, but it, it was all about rehearsing with him and, rehe and then rehearsing on location. Um, and even though there's a lot of violent scenes in this film, um, we... We, we meticulously rehearsed it. And we, we um, also had a script which we adhered to, but we did do bits of ad-libbing around it. Um, and so there was a certain amount of freedom with that. But it was, it was so um, controversial. I can't underestimate tell you how controversial it was when it went out. And... Um, I think you know. Still now, it looks like a pretty, a pretty, um, it's, it's quite a, hard a pretty watch. graphic film uh, to watch. And certainly, certainly, the, the use of the Steadicam enhances the the feel, the feel of the piece, the mode of it. The uh, it, it's it's great. I really like I really like working on Steadicam. It's um, yeah, it's good. Um, the the by contrast, but the great piece of acting contained absolutely within a frame and what is I think for the most part a static shot is the opening um, scene from Asghar Fahadi's A Separation which you will have seen um, and then I thought it would be interesting to show you some rushes and I've put in uh, some rushes from Happy Go Lucky which are Sally Hawkins and Eddie Marsan. Um, so that you, you're actually looking at 
uh, actors who are absolutely on top of it, but still dealing with pr pressures. And then the final clip is a surprise. So, enjoy. <laughs> Spoke when that kid is in this house, he's safe, right? Talking about his safe. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, supposedly standing knives lying around in the house, don't they? To talking about that, that's that's big boys' games, Bex. Yeah, yeah. Don't turn your back no, on I'm me. I'm turning me back. I'm getting a drink and all that. Exactly fucking running away. I'm going to eat your naked boys. We're going to fucking go. Yeah, it's too right. Look, it is late. You're tired, etc., etc., etc. I said, I am sorry. You know, I am sorry. I'm more sorry than you know. I'm going to put up with all this emotional crap. I don't see why. He's all you right, I told you. He won't happen again. He could have swallowed it. He could have poked it. You never! Fucking matter. I do not want you to carry a blade in this house, right? This is a normal house with normal people. I don't want to be the third year old boot boy. You're a fucking joke. I don't see anyone laughing at me. No, no, you don't. No, they won't laugh at you. We're not to your face anyway. But they laugh at me, darling, for putting up with you. You don't see it. What I want to know is what's so bad about being normal, eh? What's wrong with being bloody normal? I told you, I need the bars. Well, buy a bloody beehive, then. It's almost funny, that is. Oh, look, don't follow me about. It's like showing a punt around the house. Stop, keep walking away from me, then. Right. I want you to stop, and I mean it this time. I told you I will. When? When you stop. Stop what? Oh, where's my coat's on the floor? Fucking animal. Do you know that? I know. Yeah, perfect. Oh, I told you I have just got to have him! Right, if you want to carry on like him, you can go back to your mother's. Go on, piss off! I want to live with a grown-up, Bex, not a 30-year-old hooligan. Oh, give me on, mate. Go I on. just have. You go chasing that Larry git, you don't stay here. Seems to me. Kick the door down. Give me something to do at the weekend. Bex! What's the matter, love? Feeling lonely already? What is it that you say is that the coffee for the coffee is not enough? If you have a coffee, you can understand it. What is it? The coffee is not enough. The coffee is not enough. The coffee is not enough. نه خیر ایشون نه معتاد نه مشکلی داره خیلی هم آدم خوب و سالمی پس برای چی میخواد رو بگیره برای اینکه ایشون نمیخواد با من بیاد همین الان ایشون بگه میاد و همین الان رضایت میدم دیگه داد خواستم پس میگیرم حاضر بیای نه خیر من حاضر نیستم چرا حاضر نیست آقا بگی چرا حاضر نیست چرا خودت میدونی نه نمیدونم لطف کن یه دور دیگه توضیح بده چرا حاضر نیست ایشون یه دلیل برای من بیاره چرا باید تو این موقعیت باشیم بریم خارج تو یه دلیل بیار چرا باید بمونی من هزار تا دلیل برات میارم یکیشو بده یکیش پدرم من پدرمو نمیتونم ول کنم بازم بگم ولی زن تو میتونی ول کنی من کی تو رو ول کردم تو منو که شوندی داد گفت تو برای من داد خواست طلاق برسید که شوندی اینجا زندگی کردن زندگی برو این اسمش ول کردن نیست آقا همین الان نگو فگه میخواد بره بره بله الان هم میگم وقتی نمیخوای من زندگی کنی من به زور که نیاوردم به زور میخوام نگرانت برم برو یه روز اومدی من میخواستم زندگی کنی امروز نمیخوای زندگی کنی وقتی ترجیح میدی بلند شی بریم اون وقت ترجیح میدی یعنی چه این کاری که ما دو تا با هم شروع کردیم حاج آقا بعد از یک سال و نیم دوندگی و خرج و مخارج بالاخره ویزای اقامت ما اومده 6 ماهی که الان ویزا اومده خب چه روز دیگه هم باطل میشه برای چی بعد این موقعیت رو از دست بدیم ما خیلی موقعیت از دست ندیم خیلی خب پیشنهاد بده تو شرایط رو الان میبینی وضعیت رو میبینی منم که شوندی اینجا پیشنهاد بده آقا چیکار کنم ایشون بهونه کردن پلاشون حاج آقا شما گفتی یه دلیل بیار من اجازه بده من صحبت کنم بفرمایید پدرشون آلزایمر داره اصلا متوجه نیست که ایشون پسرش اطرافش کی هست به حالش چه فرقی این حرفو میزنی فرق میکنه باشه اون میفهمه که تو پسرشی من که میفهمم اون پدرمه دخترت برات اهمیت نداره آینده دخترت برای تو مهم نیست اصلا مگه من بحثمو بحث دخترمه چرا فکر میکنی فقط برای تو مهم آینده دخترمه این همه بچه تیم مملکت داره زندگی میکنه یعنی هیچ کدوم آینده ندارن خانم من ترجیح میدم بچه‌م تو این شرایط بزرگ نشه آقا به عنوان مادر این حقو چه شرایطی چه شرایطی خانم بچه تون اینجا پدر مادر بالا سرش باشه براش بهتره یا اون وقت پدر بالا سرش نباشه منم برای همین از ایشون دارم خواهش میکنم با ما بیاد من تو وضعیت نیستم که بلند شم بیام چند بار باید اینا تکرار کنم خب ایشون بخوای بازم بگم ایشون که این وضعیت رو نداره من الان تکلیفم چی میشه آجا هیچی بفهم از زندگیتون اگه میتونستیم که دادخواست طلاق نمیدادن خانم ایشون هم باید برای طلاق راضی باشه توافق دو طرف باید باشه خب ایشون که میگه راضیه مگه الان نمیگه راضیه شما حاضر با طلاق بدین اگه ایشون رفتن اونور به شوهر بچه ترجیح میده من مخالفتی ندارم برم 
بسیار خوب ایشون که رضایت میده تکلیف دخترم چی میشه همه چیز باید توافق بشه خانم دخترتون چند سالشه دو هفته دیگه میشه 11 سالش تموم بشه پدرش اگه اجازه نده نمیتونه با شما بیاد خانم پدرش اجازه نمیده دیگه اون خودتون میدونید به سلامت بفهمید آقا اینجوری امضا کنید بفهمید حاج آقا من اومدم اینجا شما مشکلم حل بکنید بفهمید اینجا امضا کنید خانم شما بفهمید کجا رو بدم جناب حاج اینجا رو تام میذارید من همه چیزامو میبخشم فقط دخترم بده به من دخترت به لحاظ عاطفی به من وابسته است از خودش نمیخواد با تو بیاد خودش نمیفهمه چرا میگی نمیفهمه 11 سالشه چرا نمیفهمه بفرمایید اینجا بزنید بفرمایید اینجا بزنید وقت دادگاه رو نگید هیچ کی نمیفهمه فقط تو میفهمی نه تویی که همه چیزو میفهمی بفرمایید وقت دادگاه رو نگید لطفا بفرمایید من چی میشه من فقط 40 روز مهلت دارم خانم اینجوری نیست که هر کی مشکل کوچیکی پیدا کنه بونه مشکل کوچیکی مشکل کوچیکی هر چی حاج آقا مشکل من مشکل کوچیک نیست من مسئله دخترمو دارم بفرمایید خانم خانم ایشون هم دخترشه ایشون هم حق داره من قاضی هم تشخیص میدم که مشکل شما مشکل کوچیکیه بفرمایید امضا کنید برید Right, check your mirrors, check your seat, make yourself comfortable. No, I don't think so. Put your seatbelt on. We're not going anywhere, Scott. What do you mean? You're in no fit state to take this lesson, all right? I'm sorry. Poppy, I'm the driving instructor, you are the pupil. You need to calm down. I am calm. You can't drive like this. How dare you comment on my driving? I think I can comment on your driving. You're putting yourself in danger. You're putting me in danger. You're putting other people in danger. It's not me, it's them. That's bullshit, Scott, all right? It's all bullshit, yeah? That's it, it's over. Well, you want this lesson to stop? Yes, I do. I don't want you to teach me, all right? Okay. Great, fantastic. You get in the passenger seat and I'll drive you home. No, I'm sorry, you're not driving. I'm driving. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Poppy, if this isn't a lesson and you can't drive. Sorry. Oh, right, check your mirrors, check your seat, make yourself comfortable. No, I don't think so. Put your seatbelt on. We're not going anywhere, Scott. What do you mean? You're in no fit state to take this lesson. Puppy, I'm the driving instructor, you are the pupil. You need to calm down. I am calm. You can't drive like this. How dare you comment on my driving? I think I can comment on your driving. You're putting yourself in danger, you're putting me in danger, you're putting other people in danger. It's not me, it's them. That's bullshit, Scott. It's all bullshit. Yeah, that's it. I don't want it. Well, you want this lesson to stop? Yes, I do. I don't want you to teach me anymore, all right? I'm sorry. Okay, great. Fantastic. You get in the passenger seat and I'll drive you home. No, I don't think so. You're not driving. I'm driving. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Poppy, if this isn't a lesson and you can't drive. You're not driving anyway, sunshine. Oh, fuck. Sorry. Right, check your mirrors, check your seat, make yourself comfortable. No, I don't think so. Put your seatbelt on. We're not going anywhere, Scott. What do you mean? You're in no fit state to take this lesson. Poppy, I'm the driving instructor, you are the pupil. You need to calm down. I am calm. You can't drive like this. How dare you comment on my driving? I think I can comment on your driving. You're putting yourself in danger, you're putting me in danger, and you're putting other people in danger. It's not me, it's them. That's bullshit, Scott. It's all bullshit, yeah? That's it. I don't want it. Well, you want this lesson to stop? Yes, I do. I don't want you to teach me anymore, all right? I'm sorry. Right, great. Fantastic. You get in the passenger seat and I'll drive you home. <laughs> no, I don't think so. You're not driving, I'm driving. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Poppy, if this isn't a lesson and you can't drive... You're not driving anywhere, sunshine. You've got two choices. Either I drive you home or you walk. I don't mind walking, but I can't let you drive this car. You can't stop me. Yes, I can. Poppy, give me the keys. No. Give me the keys to my car. No, I don't think so. Poppy, I'm going to ask you one more time. Please give me the keys to my car. I'm oh, sorry, Scott. I can't do that, all right? Give me the fucking keys to my car! <laughs> Get the fuck out! Give me! Get Right, check your mirrors, check your seat, make yourself comfortable. No, I don't think so. Put your seatbelt on. We're not going anywhere, Scott. What do you mean? You're in no fit state to take this lesson. Poppy, I'm the driving instructor, you are the pupil. You need to calm down. I am calm. You can't drive like this. How dare you comment on my driving? I think I can comment on your driving. You're putting yourself in danger, you're putting me in danger, and you're putting other people in danger. It's not me, it's them. That's bullshit, Scott. It's all bullshit, yeah? That's it. I don't want it. Well, you want this lesson to stop? Yes, I do. I don't want you to teach me anymore, all right? I'm sorry. Okay, great. Fantastic. You get in the passenger seat and I'll drive you home. No, I don't think so. You're not driving. I'm driving. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Poppy, if this isn't a lesson and you can't drive. You're not driving anyway, sunshine. You've got two choices. Either I drive you home or you walk. I don't mind walking, but I can't let you drive this car. You can't stop me. Yes, I can. Poppy. 
Give me the keys. No. Give me the keys to my car. No, I don't think so. Poppy, I'm going to ask you one more time. Please give me the keys to my car. I'm sorry, Scott, but I can't do give that. Give me the fucking keys to my car. Get give me the fuck off. Mary! Get off me! Fucking get away from me! Fucking... I called Mama. She was so happy she cried. She wants you to have her wedding gown. It's white lace. Yeah, that's good. I can't get married in your mother's dress. <laughs> she and I, we are not built the same way. We can have it altered. Yeah, no, you don't. That's good. I'm good on level with you. We can't get married at all. Why not? Well, in the first place, I'm not a natural blonde. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. I smoke. I smoke all the time. I don't care. Well, I have a terrible past. For three years now, I've been living with a saxophone player. I forgive you. I can never have children. We can adopt some. But you don't understand, Osgood. Um, I'm a man. Well, nobody's perfect. I mean, um, I, I suppose I should just say that, um, obviously, having gone out of my way to show actors having a bad time and being unconfident, uh, it was, I felt it was good to look at people who know what they're doing and are supported by everything that's going on. And they're all very... Uh, I mean, it's, and it's the, the, from a cinematic point of view, it's very clear and integrated and the acting is liberated. Mm, mm. Uh, thank you for a fascinating discussion so far. Um, we've got about 15, 20 minutes to take questions from the audience, please. I'm just curious how aware the, camera, uh, the actors are of each shot that you create, so are they aware that it's a two shot to medium close up and also um, I'm wondering if you think that um, actors may benefit from a verite sort of style of shooting where there are, you don't put marks down and they're very unaware of the camera and the camera and lighting have to adapt to them. <laughs> uh, well, first that, question. Mike, that, that first question was definitely for you. How, how much of your technical decisions do you share with your cast? Well, uh, um, it, it goes back to what we were saying about um, I mean, you know, one starts from the premise that, that we're all sophisticated grown-ups and we're doing a job together. That's to start with. Um, I mean, an actor... Tell me what you think. I mean, an actor... There, there are things an actor doesn't want, to be, want, doesn't, doesn't want to be concerned with or concerned about or distracted by. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, you're always going to be aware whether we're on a... A mm. two shot or a, what, yes, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's, I mean, we're all there doing this. It, I mean, apart from anything else, in the grander scheme of things, filmmaking is a highly sophisticated communal activity, professional, industrial process and communal activity. So, you know, you know, people are aware and know what's going on, but, um, the kind of acting where the actor is entirely preoccupied with what's happening technically to the exclusion of what the actor should be doing is obviously not healthy. What was the second part of your question? Um, just curious um, what you think of the benefits and maybe some of the detriments of working with a more verite sort of approach where... Of not putting um, marks down and all the rest Yeah, of not putting marks down, um, shooting uh, maybe long takes with the camera um, at a very long distance from the actors where they're completely unaware of it. You know, the fact is that there are all kinds of films and all kinds of styles and all kinds of ways of using the tools of filmmaking creatively and all kinds of films. Um, uh, you know, there's no... We all know that having to put marks down on the floor so that the actor's in the right place uh, for focus, um, in some ways, it can be a damn nuisance, especially if it becomes fetishised or distracting. But on the other hand, um, 
you know, people get used to how to deal, actors, you get used to how to, as to, how to deal with that, don't you? Yes, I mean, you, I mean, you know, it's, it doesn't feel like a massive compromise to have to sometimes accommodate a mark on the, you know, because it, it, you, you, that's just what you have to do. And it's, you know, it's just part of the thing that we've talked about a lot tonight, of, a, of aligning what you're doing creatively with a, with, a, with a discipline that has to be in place. But, I mean, you know, if um, it suits a kind of storytelling or a kind of taste um, and thus results in a certain kind of style where you shoot in a very fluid way that eschews those things or doesn't need those disciplines, but if you're going to shoot, then that's fine. But it's horses for courses. If you want to shoot in a... a as, as it so happens, I and my comrades do, uh, in a what is basically a classical discipline style um, and you, you actually on the whole wanted to be in focus and all the rest of it uh, then you have to use the technology to achieve it but it has to be what we've been talking about for the most part and really what Leslie just said it, provided it's integrated into the creative and doesn't inhibit or destroy it then it's part and parcel I mean, we know that they say that um, the reason why you always see Spencer Tracy looking down when he plays his characters is he's getting on his mark. Um, so there is, that is one way of dealing with it. <laughs> now, let's move on. So there's a question down the front here, please. Um, Leslie, you mentioned that the small, intricate details is something that you really enjoy about film, acting for film, like the, thick, the flick of an eye or just the small things that you have to do. Do you use those techniques on stage as well because you enjoy to do so? Um, well, it's different on stage because the audience are seeing you, as it were, in a sense, in a long shot compared to film, unless it's a... Well, you're in a small theatre, which is we did a, the last play we did in but a... But they're still league. seeing you in a long shot. But they are still yeah, seeing you in a long shot. the whole of you, not just... Your That's face. right, yeah. So it's, it's, it's sort of... It's sort of different, but um, but having said that, you know, you 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 can do very small things on stage that can be that can be seen. It, it, it's just uh, knowing the parameters, you know, of what of, of 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 the space that you're working in, really, and what will work and what won't work. I mean, just two thoughts about that. Um, one is that, um, in fact when you were talking about those small things, you were actually talking, I think, we could say you were talking about what you celebrate about film acting itself, yes. per se. I mean, that's the joy of film acting. But quite another thought is that, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, you can't have a close-up on stage. And I don't think that's true. I think of a play... I mean, I mean, this, I'm not talking actually. Of course, actually, you can't have a close-up on stage. You're always in a long shot, obviously. But in fact, if a play is on the stage is directed in a sophisticated and um, uh, artful way, um, the audience can be drawn into a close-up, and, mm. and the actor performs in such a way that the, the, the audience can be drawn in. Mm. Um, mm. But that's more kind of metaphysical than, actu than actual, than technical. Thanks. There was a, another question over this side. Just two very quick questions. Um, Leslie, I just wondered if, in terms of being an actor, did you have any formal training? Did you go to um, RADA or places like that? And my second one was, um, if you were off in a desert island and you could only take one film, what would each of your films be? Um, well, um, I sort of had an unconventional start, really, because I was... I, I was sort of thinking I was going to pursue singing, um, and I didn't really know what to do. Um, I, I, my parents didn't particularly know how to help me, and I decided, aged 15, that the best possible thing to do would be to leave school <laughs> and go to a stage school. Um, so I went to the Italia Conti Stage School for about nine months, and then um, started working. Um, and that was what it was. I mean, I certainly didn't continue my education there, which had been the plan, because the education there wasn't really up to very much. So, thank goodness I started working, and that was it, really. But I did sort of um, 
uh, and Mike's heard this lots of times before, but I did sort of uh, flounder around and um, I, I, I sort of played all these parts that were exactly like me and that's all I ever played when I was very young because I, 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 I didn't really think about it. I didn't consider the kind of actress I wanted to be or I certainly didn't have an intellectual view on it. You were in lots of television series. I did lots of television, yes, when I was young. And then around about my, around my early 20s, I met Mike and we worked together for the first time and um, it was just great. I just... I was so sort of liberated by it, and um, the way he works made sense to me, and I really, really enjoyed it, um, and I started to see through Mike that I could play people that weren't like me, and I have to say, that's been the most uh, fa fantastic gift, because A, it means I think you can have a nice long career, because nobody ever plonks you in the same part all the time, and um, uh, it, it just makes it all more interesting as well. Uh, I don't know about my desert island film. We haven't been, we've not, we, we've not come here to talk about that sort of thing at all, have we? No, no. not really, not no. desert island no, films. No, I'm sorry, it's out of order, that question. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> next question. We'll have to move on. The, the next question was uh, a row or two in front of you. If you just throw your hand up, yes, sir. Um, in both of your experience, do you feel that theatrical experience makes someone a better film actor? I, I don't know. I think what I feel about myself is, as I've, you know, it's, it's not, nothing groundbreaking I'm going to say, but as I've got older, I've just got better. But I wouldn't say that that's because of um, one feeding the other, because I do... I do think technically they're very, obviously, they're very different and different skills are required. Um, but in a way, I don't see it like that. I just, I think, I think my acting's got stronger. Um, but that's about something else, I think. I think that's just about absorbing life and, um, and, and experiencing life and then having uh, an ability to, in a way, I suppose... Uh, display some of those aspects of one's life or emotions. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know that I do feel that really. I think that um, I, I, I would agree because, uh, uh, on one level, because um, there are, in world, <coughs> in world cinema, there are all kinds of great performances from actors, including act uh, on film, amateur actors or child actors and people who haven't, don't come from the theatre. Um, and that those performances uh, are absolutely um, pure and brilliant and those people have no experience of theatre mm. of any kind because it's about film acting. On the other hand, it would also be true to say, I, I think from, certainly from my um, experience, to a considerable extent that although, and we've talked about the differences between the media and all the rest of it, that um, so that isn't really the point, but it is the case that actors who've got experience of sustained performance and of rehearsal and of rehear the whole thing of preparing something and spending time at it, which is something that is something that um, is more prevalent in the theatre context. That does help um, with the acting. So there are things to be gained and learnt from acting on a stage and, you know, and learning how to, to sustain a performance and so forth. But it would be wrong to say that one is absolutely necessarily contingent on the other. So let's take one final question. I'm going to go to the back if I can. There's one right over there. So, Leslie, you talked briefly about how um, it may be a luxury for a director to have the time to prepare in the way that you might want them to. So I just wanted to ask... Well, like, as, like they would want to as well, Exactly, probably. like they would yeah. want to. So I just wanted to ask, maybe to Mike, if, um, if you were given the opportunity to direct a film that was perhaps a bit more ambitious in terms of locations and budget and... I don't know, maybe like a Bond film or something. Would you do you do you regard this process as being the top 
priority and therefore would you would you kind of cherish that and, and turn down a film that was not turned down but do you know what I mean is is this the top priority this this preparation this it's not a question of priority it's a question of um, how uh, the, the only way I know to get things to happen but as it so happens I, I haven't this hasn't been announced yet but I'm directing the next Bond film <laughs> and no, this is, it's funny you should ask that question because we are, we are going to be in rehearsal for three years before we start. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a fantastic oh, point. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go and Leslie's playing James Bond. <laughs> Thank you to everyone here at the Regent Street Cinema for having us here tonight. Um, thanks to Ben Gibson and everyone at the uh, London Film School for partnering with um, myself and my colleagues at Time Out on these events. And just a reminder that our next event is at the end of May and will feature Nick Broomfield in a discussion about documentaries. Um, thanks also to Don Boyd and Highbrow who have been filming the event here tonight. And most of all, of course, thank you very, very much to Leslie Manville and Mike Lee for sharing your ideas and experiences. Thank you.